This is AONM's third webinar in the mitochondrial series, and we're delighted to have Dr. Sarah Myhill with us this evening. She's going to be speaking about how mitochondrial dysfunction is linked to chronic disease and what we can do about it. It's a particularly special day as it's um, International Awareness Day for chronic immunological and neurological disease. Dr. Sarah Myhill qualified in medicine with honors from Middlesex Hospital Medical School in 1981 and has since focused tirelessly on identifying and treating the underlying causes of health problems, especially the diseases of civilization with which we are beset in the West. She has worked in the NHS and private practice and for 17 years was the honorary secretary of the British Society for Ecological Medicine, which focuses on the causes of disease and treating through diet, vitamins, and minerals and through avoiding toxic stress. She's now a patron of the College of Naturopathic Medicine and was recently presented with their outstanding contribution in the field of Natural Medicine Award 2022. And she's recently been appointed their clinical director. So um, this is going to be a very exciting webinar. Please do put your questions in either the chat or the Q&A, and we'll leave lots of time for questions at the end. So even though her presentation is quite detailed, you will receive it as uh, you know, a, a, a handout afterwards. So don't worry if she doesn't go over every word. And over to you, Sarah, look forward, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jill, and you're very kind. Um, so let me share the PowerPoint so you can all um, see what I'm talking about. Here we go. Okay, so uh, my remit was how is mitochondrial dysfunction linked to chronic disease and what can we do about it? Now, as Julian points out, I was at med medical school in the 1970s and I remember doing uh, biochemistry exams then. And in biochemistry, we learned about um, uh, some of the biochemistry of mitochondria. And it was the sort of subject that you mugged up the night before on black coffee and chocolate biscuits and hoped that you would remember sufficient to pass your biochemistry exam. And the reason we did it like that is because mitochondria didn't seem very important. Uh, they had no clinical implications for knowing about mitochondrial uh, function, how mitochondria work. And now that has gone completely topsy-turvy. And now it's the other way around. Um, now it's difficult to find a disease where mitochondria are not implicated. So, um, um, oh, go to the next slide. So uh, oh, that's who I am, uh, Gillian said all that. So the point here is that there are two major drivers of Western disease. And those mechanisms are first, energy delivery mechanisms, and secondly, inflammation. And we now know that mitochondria are centrally involved in both energy delivery and in inflammation. And as I said, so it's difficult to find a pathology where mitochondria are not involved. So whatever pathology you are faced with, uh, uh, look after your mitochondria. So that's just a slide I picked off um, offline, which just gives you uh, a, a few of the conditions. And of course, if mitochondria are associated with energy delivery mechanisms, what that means is that if energy delivery mechanisms to an organ are, are inadequate, then that organ will go slow. And ultimately that organ will fail. So mitochondria involved in brain failure, and there's some conditions there, heart failure, endocrine um, uh, disease, kidney disease, eye disease, hearing, gastrointestinal, I, say, I can't think of a disease where mitochondria are not implicated. Now the early stages of mitochondrial failure are characterized by fatigue. And this is a, a nice quick whiz through of the mechanisms and what you can do um, uh, yourself to help yourself. Uh, my daughter came up with a name, the energy equation from the naked ape to the knackered ape. And that's what's happened to, to humans because uh, we are better, potentially better nourished, potentially more comfortable than ever, but the uh, uh, instance of fatigue syndromes is absolutely skyrocketing. And much of that is because we're not looking after our mitochondria. So late stage mitochondrial failure is, is characterized by, here we go, premature aging, organ phase that we've just talked about. Of course, when the immune system fails, then you're at risk of cancer, and the, the immune system is responsible for healing and repair. And if you haven't got the energy for healing and repair, then you will suffer degenerative conditions, heart failure, dementia, et cetera, et cetera. So 
They are in, involved in almost any pathology and in the short term, they are centrally involved in fatigue syndromes and ME. So we have to ask the question, what, how and why do mitochondria go slow? Because if we can establish the mechanisms by which mitochondria go slow, then that has obvious implications for management. And you know, these are the mechanisms. First of all, they've got to have the right fuel in the tank. So you know, I've got a, an ancient truck out there that chums along quite nicely on diesel, but if I put petrol in it, it's not good to go. And the right fuel, the preferred fuel for mitochondria are ketones. Mitochondria may be going slow because they're deficient in something. Uh, they may be going slow because they are inhibited by some sort of toxin and there are a whole range of poisonous uh, poison conditions which present with fatigue like Gulf War syndrome, um, uh, aerotoxic syndrome, 9-11 uh, syndrome, where people are poisoned um, and, uh, and they develop fatigue as a result. All the control mechanisms are down. And in that respect, I'm thinking of the thyroid accelerator pedal and the adrenal gearbox. Now, the single, now if, if as a result of today's seminar, you do nothing other than sort out your diet and get onto paleo ketogenic diet, then you will be doing yourself a, a huge favor. And if you are a therapist treating patients uh, with these conditions, then uh, by dint of doing these, the diet yourself, by dint of putting these interventions in your, yourself, and of course this will slow the aging process and allow you to live to your full potential, you will then be in a much better place to inspire um, your patients who uh, you are going to be treating. And um, as I say, the single most important uh, uh, intervention is the paleo ketogenic diet. And that's a book that's just come out. And these uh, next slides are from uh, paleo ketogenic, the why and the how. And when people say to me, well, why paleo ketogenic? I mean, it's very simple. That is the evolutionary correct diet. Most of the months, nine months, 10 months of the year, we should be, uh, we will be in ketosis and, uh, and uh, fueling our body with fat and with fiber. There is a small window of time when uh, autumn comes along and we get free food. We have a windfall of um, uh, vegetables, nuts, uh, seeds, fruit, root vegetables, carbohydrate foods. They switch on the addiction gene. We eat those foods in an addictive way. We get fat. And that, of course, is survival value for the winter. But um, uh, primitive, primitive man and primitive woman stopped eating those foods because they had to. They simply ran out. Modern man, modern women can eat those foods all year round because of modern agriculture and food delivery systems. It is not good news. It's not good for our health. So we should also be taking a basic pack of supplements simply because there's a one-way cycle of micronutrients from the soil, plants, animals, us, and, uh, uh, and we discard them, we don't recycle them onto the soil. So we should all be taking a basic package of supplements, a good multivitamin, the good minerals, and some essential fatty acids. That's the bare minimum. I'm going to whiz through these because um, I've prepared slides for an hour and a half. Whoops. Uh, and uh, we've not got an hour and a half, we've got um, uh, a bit less, less than that. But first of all, make sure you're eating sufficient calories. And to calculate your calorie uh, requirement, again, details in the book and on that previous slide. And then protein, this is not a high protein diet. It's uh, not too little and not too much. It's the right amount of protein. And uh, there's some fascinating work done by two evolutionary biologists who fed insects, low protein diets, normal protein diets, and high protein diets. And what's so fascinating is insects, and this actually applies to all other animals, eat to satisfy their protein appetite. So if you're eating a low protein diet, you will go on eating until that protein appetite is satisfied. In doing so, you will overeat and get fat. Conversely, if you put somebody on a high protein diet or an insect rather on a high protein diet, uh, their protein appetite will be uh, quickly satisfied. They will undereat and they will end up getting thin. So the right amount of protein, say not too little, not too much. Uh, and then we have to look at fiber, because as I say, this diet, with this diet, we fuel our body with fat and we fuel our body with the fermentation of fiber in the large bowel. That can potentially bring, uh, produce up to 500 kilocalories a day of energy. And there's a lot more that goes on in the microbiome, in the large bowel. It's not just the fermentation of fiber for fuel. There's education of the immune system goes on there, synthesis of vitamins, synthesis of neurotransmitters. Um, uh, it's uh, essential bulking uh, in order to allow uh, uh, good gut-gut transit time. Uh, so getting the uh, 
the fiber correct is, is very important. And essentially, uh, you should go on eating fiber until, as I call it, your number twos look like number fours. So uh, when you effortlessly daily produce a, uh, a cucumber shaped sized turd, which comes away effortlessly, then you've got the dose of a fiber about right. Then we need fats and oils, uh, which are essential uh, fuels and building materials. So saturated fats provide the perfect fuel for the body. So saturated fats like coconut oil, uh, palm oil, uh, lard, um, butter, as long as you're not uh, dairy allergic. Uh, these are ideal um, fats to power the body. And then in addition to that, we need oils uh, and uh, uh, because they act as uh, the building blocks. They are essential for membrane function. And to say in nature, there's no such thing as a bad fat. All fats in nature are good. And saturated fats are short chain, uh, carbon backbone, and they are saturated with hydrogen ions, which means they're very stable and very stiff. And that's what we cook with. Unsaturated fats, by contrast, are missing a hydrogen atom and they have a double bond. And so they have a kink. So that is an omega-3 fat. And that is an omega-6 and that will be omega-9. So they are bendy, they're boomerang shaped in nature. And in nature, these are all left-handed fats. And, uh, but the problem is if you hydrogenate them, or you make margarine, or you cook with them, they will flip into a right-handed trans fat and that's bad news. So fats are very important, but um, uh, uh, you've got to look after them. Okay, carbohydrates, again, you might think I'm maligning carbohydrates. They are, but carbohydrates are essential. It's simply that sugars and refined carbohydrates are so addictive, we end up uh, uh, over consuming them. But some carbohydrates are important because they are the raw material from which we make five carbon sugars like D-ribose. And from that, we can make ATP, we make DNA, and we can make RNA. Um, also, we need sugar in the liver for the business of detoxification. And that pathway is called the glucuronidation pathway. About 10% of the population are deficient in that. And this condition is called Gilbert syndrome or Gilbert syndrome because uh, it was actually a Frenchman. And what we know is people with Gilbert syndrome are particularly prone to fatigue syndrome because they are slow detoxifying. They cannot get rid of toxins efficiently. And uh, I now know um, that by treating that with uh, giving people glutathione to support the other pathways, uh, this can be greatly ameliorated. So you can you can monitor this very carefully by uh, if you measure bilirubin in the in the bloodstream. I like it to be below about twelve. If it's much above that, then you should be taking glutathione for life. People with Gilbert syndrome often have a bilirubin of in the twenties or the thirties. I saw a gentleman yesterday who had a bilirubin of forty-two. And, and look slightly jaundiced as a result. Okay, and then you need to get into ketosis. And um, uh, the, the way to make sure that you're in ketosis is to measure. Uh, actually um, get the test uh, and measure, and you can do it with urine tests, with blood tests, or with breath tests. I personally prefer the breath test. I'm not going to go into this because um, I'm a bit squeezed for time, but the details are there. Those are the three types of ketones that arise through fat burning, and that uh, indicates what and how can be, can be measured. And again, so having got people established on a paleo ketogenic diet, the next thing we have to do is tackle the upper fermenting gut. And this is extremely common problem. Uh, you know, most people uh, spend their lives fueling their body with sugars and carbohydrates, and with time and with age, eventually they overwhelm the ability of the gut to deal with that large amount of sugar and carbohydrates. So we end up with an upper fermenting gut. Of course, the upper gut should be a sterile, digesting, carnivorous gut, just like a dog, uh, for the purposes of digesting uh, meat and for digesting uh, protein um, and, and for absorbing fat. But once it starts fermenting, you are in, you are in big uh, trouble. So uh, that's uh, what the um, uh, what should be, we say we should have enough gut that is sterile. But if you start fermenting, you get all these problems. Now you can read, so I'm not going to go through it. But first of all, you ferment to produce nasty toxins. Uh, this is also called the auto brewery syndrome. Colonies of bacteria, micro, uh, fungi, uh, viruses maybe pick up, uh, build up, and uh, they produce toxins uh, which are poisonous to the system and have to be dealt with by the liver. Bacterial endotoxin, fungal mycotoxin. 
um, the, and the liver to deal with those toxins. It takes an awful lot of raw material and energy to do that. And so often people comment that once they get keto adapted, they immediately get a boost of energy. And the reason for that is the liver is not spending so much energy on the business of detoxification. To put a few numbers to that, at rest, uh, the brain uh, weighs 2% of body weight, consumes 20% of energy. The heart consumes about 7% of energy, but the liver consumes 27% of all the energy generated by the body. It's massive. A huge amount of energy goes into the business of detoxification, and that all has to be generated by, of course, mitochondria. So as soon as you take the, uh, uh, the toxic pressure off the liver, you then have more energy to spend on other things. Uh, and then other problems you get, uh, uh, now microbes, bacterial translocation is a major driver of pathology. You know, we're taught at medical school that yes, there are bacteria and yeast in the gut, but there they stay. And we now know that is not true. We now know microbes quite easily get into the bloodstream and they get stuck at distal sites. And it is my view that this drives so much pathology. Pathology like fibromyalgia, inflammation of the muscles inflammatory arthritis and degenerative arthritis, so osteoarthritis and uh, 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 rheumatoid, psoriatic, uh, uh, ankylosing spondylitis, rhitis syndrome, all these conditions. Uh, they get into blood vessels and drive arteritis, so polyarthritis uh, nodosa, polymyalgia rheumatica, uh, intrinsic asthma, uh, brain disease, psychological problems, inflammatory bowel disease, a chronic urticaria, venous ulcers. I believe all these conditions are driven by allergy to microbes from the upper fermented gut. Of course, um, uh, uh, that's a little bit how that, that helps you diagnose um, uh, fermentation. I mean, uh, of course, if you are fermenting fiber, normally in the large bowel, you will produce hydrogen and methane. So yes, you may well fart, but that will be inoffensive. You can't smell it. If you've got foul smelling wind, then you have overwhelmed the ability of the gut to deal with proteins upstream, those proteins get fermented downstream, hydrogen sulfide, foul smelling wind. So it's a very useful clinical clue that tells you if you've got the balance of protein right, if you've got reasonable digestion, and, uh, and whether you're fermenting correctly in the lower bowel. So how do we treat the upper fermenting gut? It's a three-pronged approach. Start out the paleoketogenic diet uh, uh, and uh, normalize digestion. And chewing is so important. Funnily enough, I went to a Maya workshop on Friday uh, which looks at the, um, uh, uh, tries to emulate the work of um, a German doctor, Meyer, who treated with great success many conditions simply through diet. And the starting point of that diet is to chew foods properly and give the gut a, and, and really help the gut to digest because all digestion starts in the mouth. Saliva contains amylases, lipases, proteases. So the digestive process starts there and the business of chewing stimulates the production of acid, stimulates the pancreas, stimulates the liver, uh, and it, you know, it's just so helpful because if you reduce those foods to a liquid, then it's going to be far more quickly digested and absorbed, so there aren't then foods left lying around uh, to be fermented by microbes. So chewing is really important, and then kill uh, um, microbes with vitamin C to bowel tolerance, uh, little and often through the day, and then last thing at night, use Lugol's iodine. This is a, a little trick I've learned recently, and it's very helpful. So we're now in a fit state to start to tackle the, the mitochondrial engine because we've got the correct fuel in the tank, that's ketones. But now say so we need the raw materials, the freedom from toxic stress, the right control mechanism, the thyroid accelerator pedal, and all these things impact on sleep. It's during sleep that, of course, the body heals and repairs. So, um, how do we know that uh, these uh, interventions work? During the 1990s, um, uh, by then I started to get interested in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome and ME. And these conditions are all characterized by severe pathological fatigue. And you know, I learned a few tricks of the trade. I knew that allergy was a big player. Um, I was giving some many people B12 injections. You know, I was get a discipline about pacing and sleep, but I knew I wasn't really cracking it. And I was asking myself, you know, what is the underlying mechanism um, uh, that's driving this condition? And um, uh, I put this question to John McLaren Howard, who was then working at um, Biolab in London. 
And I said, you know, I think there might be an element of mitochondrial dysfunction. Now, at this point in the 1990s, mitochondria were not thought to be implicated in anything. They certainly weren't mentioned for heart disease or cancer or dementia or anything like that. They really were just a bit of a biochemical oddity then. Anyway, John developed a mitochondrial function test, which he called ATP study. Uh, and this is an illustration of what a brilliant uh, biochemist he is. And really, if anybody should have the Nobel Prize for biochemistry, it should be John McCarran Howard. And um, uh, he, he developed this test, which measures how fast ATP is produced in mitochondria, uh, how efficiently it's moved from mitochondria across mitochondrial membranes into the cytosol, where it is needed to generate energy, how efficiently energy can be uh, uh, taken from, my, from uh, a molecule of ATP, and that's a magnesium dependent process, and then how well ATP can be recycled back into mitochondria. And uh, that test um, uh, is, a, is a qualitative and quantitative. And from that test, we were allowed to calculate a mitochondrial function score, because if any one of those conditions, any one of those processes is going slow, then uh, the ability of mitochondria to generate uh, ATP is similarly slow. So by the sort of 2005, 2006, 2007, I had accumulated uh, uh, 71 patients with whom I was really stuck. And during these years, uh, we, we uh, arranged for those patients to have mitochondrial function tests. Now, this was not done placebo controlled double blind. We didn't have the resources to do that, but it was done blindly because I saw the patients clinically and agreed an energy score with them. The blood test then went to um, Acumen Laboratories uh, and uh, John McCann had, of course, didn't know how disabled the patient was. He did the mitochondrial function test. Uh, and then a third party, Professor um, uh, uh, Norman Booth at Mansfield College, Oxford, he collated the results and published the paper. And this was published in the Journal of Clinical Experimental Medicine in January 2009. So that's uh, uh, a resume of what the paper is all about. But this was the most important graph that came out of that paper. Essentially, uh, the mitochondrial energy score is on the vertical axis there. The, uh, level of disability uh, is on the horizontal axis there and compared to controls uh, there was a straight line relationship pretty much between how disabled these people were and their mitochondrial function. It was the a first objective test that well, in my view is just the first study that really showed that there was serious mitochondrial pathology in people with chronic fatigue syndromes and ME. So then we had to ask the question well if we put in place the necessary interventions, uh, does that impact on mitochondrial function? Does, do, 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 do people improve? So um, I've tailored treatments for these patients individually, depending on the results of their tests. Were they deficient? Were they toxic? Uh, uh, were they eating evolutionally correct diet? Uh, da 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 And uh, 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 so that's how we tailored the, uh, uh, the treatments. And then this is the, our third paper which looks at mitochondrial function before and after the relevant interventions. So uh, each one of these uh, 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 represents a patient and the purple column represents the mitochondrial function score before and the yellow common, uh, column, the mitochondrial function uh, score afterwards. And as you can see, and these first uh, 30 uh, patients uh, all put in place the necessary interventions. And what's so fascinating is every single one improved their mitochondrial function score. There are four patients who, for reasons best known to them, didn't do the regimes, they couldn't do the diets, uh, they didn't take the supplements, and, and, and for those four patients, their mitochondrial function uh, score worsened. So although the numbers were, were small, the statistics were very powerful. This was a highly statistical uh, it's significant study. So the important point that comes from this study is that you don't have to you don't have to do the test to recover. The interventions work reliably well, and that's what uh, I've been relying on that to a large extent uh, subsequently. Now, at the moment, Acumen tests are no longer available, but Professor Koenig is involved, offering very similar tests to uh, the Academy of, of Nutritional Medicine. So if you are uh, enthusiastic about having the test, do get in touch with Gillian who can set you up with this test and it's going to be very useful for many people. So again, whoops-a-daisy, uh, the treatment is uh, 
provide the mitochondria with the right fuel, the raw materials, reduces toxic stress, de da de da de da, and do these in the right order. So, what are the raw materials that mitochondria need daily for enzyme systems to work efficiently? Now, um, this was not done on guesswork. All these parameters were measured as a part of the mitochondrial function test workup. So we measured routinely CoQ10. And I have to say, if somebody was not taking supplements, CoQ10 deficiency was almost invariable. Uh, and with age, our ability to synthesize our own CoQ10 declined. So you could argue that with age, we should all be taking CoQ10 uh, uh, 100 milligrams daily in order to slow the aging process and, and, and support our mitochondria. Again, magnesium deficiency was extremely common. Uh, and 300 milligrams usually corrects well so long as you are taking vitamin D. You need vitamin D to be able to absorb magnesium. Without that, you'll malabsorb. And I found that by using big dose of uh, vitamin D, it means we rarely have to resort to magnesium injection. Niacinamide, 1500 milligrams. Again, that was almost invariably deficient. In fact, before John developed his ATP studies, uh, he did uh, many tests looking at the activity of the uh, mitochondrial respiratory enzyme to see if he could find a correlation there. There was no one respiratory enzyme that, that, that really showed up, but uh, niacinamide, the levels of NAD in the, red, in, the, in, the, uh, in the blood, that corresponded very closely to the level of fatigue. So niacinamide is a very important intermediate and uh, again, an inexpensive uh, and extremely safe. Acetyl L-carnitine, now that is uh, uh, the carrier mechanism by which you get acetate groups from the cytosol into mitochondria. So acetyl L-carnitine sits on mitochondrial membranes, uh, uh, it grabs an acetate group, flicks it into the mitochondria, drops it off, and in doing so, converts it back to L-carnitine, and then goes back, grabs another acetate group. That's called the carnitine sh uh, shuttle. And I liken that to uh, the fuel pump that, that gets fuel into your car in order to power your car engine. Uh, 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 and vegetarians and vegans are almost invariably deficient. If you are eating meat uh, and, uh, and fish and eggs and you have a non-fermenting gut and good digestion, then acetyl carnitine is usually abundant in the system. So if you're, if you're vegetarian or vegan, it's common to be deficient. So those people would absolutely uh, need a supplement. Vitamin B12, again, very helpful. D-ribose, now I used to use D-ribose uh, on a regular basis, but these days I tend to save that as a rescue remedy. Well, it's A, because it's rather expensive, and B, it's a sugar and D. Add to the carbohydrate load, so it makes it more tricky doing the PK diet. And the idea here is that if you really overdo things on a day, and you know from experience, you are going to get delayed fatigue, and delayed fatigue, of course, is pathological. If you know you're going to get delayed fatigue, that's the time to take D-ribose at night, because um, there's good evidence to suggest that the delayed fatigue results from a complete depletion of endogenous ATP, uh, and uh, uh, by taking D-ribose, that allows the body to replenish uh, much more quickly and efficiently. Okay, and again, funny enough, this, this came landed on my desk literally this morning, uh, a study uh, done in Sweden where they took uh, 443 uh, male and female volunteers and they followed them up for five years and they gave them some extra CoQ10 and some selenium. And compared to placebo, that halved cardiovascular mortality. CoQ10 is specific for mitochondria. So you look after your mitochondria, and you'll protect yourself from heart disease. That's a lovely clinical study. Now, the third way uh, in which mitochondria can be going slow is because they're inhibited by something. Now, this is uh, a compilation of um, uh, studies, uh, tests done at um, Acumen Laboratories called translocated protein studies. And this is a way of looking at how mitochondria are inhibited by something. And I've been through my uh, 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 records and the, what comes up time and time and time again is lactic acid. Lactic acid is a profound inhibitor of mitochondria. And this emphasizes the importance of pacing. Pacing is really boring, but it's absolutely essential, uh, in, especially in the early stages of chronic fatigue or ME, because if you don't pace well, you go into anaerobic metabolism and you produce lactic acid and that makes things much worse. So very boring, I know, but this is the biochemical reason why pacing is just so important. Products of fermenting gut often come up, of course, and, and we treat that uh, as we've uh, mentioned. 
and diabeno compounds um, from hair and food drugs. So that's dyes. So the only uh, safe hair dye uh, is henna. So you've got to be like me. You've got to go grey gracefully. Uh, P.G. Woodhouse, one of my favourite comic writers, comments that there actually is a cure for, uh, uh, for grey hair. Um, it was invented by a Frenchman and, and it's called the guillotine. But uh, guess what? I think I will uh, keep my grey hair. Uh, and then these are other uh, compounds which work, which commonly come up on uh, transacase protein studies. Uh, so you can read, I'm not going to read those out, but do your best to clean up your environment. And on the highly high, suggest poor antioxidant status. So uh, uh, that's how you can improve that. And then occasionally we see mycotoxins, viral proteins, immunoglobulins, which again points to an infectious inhibitor of mitochondrial function. Now, broadly speaking, there are four groups of, of, of toxins that demand different uh, uh, methods of diagnosis and treatment. Products the aforementioned gut, well, we've talked about that. Very important to get that right. Pesticides and volatile organic compounds. Uh, well, we don't have to measure those because, you know, I must have done well, uh, many hundreds of tests and I've never seen a normal result. We are all poisoned by something. You may well get clues from the history, but the bottom line is, do your best to avoid those things. So good chemical cleanup in the house, think about your occupation, but they can be got rid of by heating regimes. And uh, heating regimes with, um, uh, work reliably well, as I'll show you in the next uh, slide. Toxic metals, we can measure that with the urine test with DMSA. Uh, the point here is that toxic metals don't come out with heating regimes. For toxic metals, we have to use um, uh, chelation therapy uh, or simply nutritional supplements like glutathione, high dose zinc, selenium to dislodge, dislodge uh, uh, metals from their binding sites. And then obviously uh, bacterial endotoxin, fungal mycotoxins, i.e. there's a chronic infection there that is inhibiting mitochondria. And uh, this is data from uh, 30 patients um, who, who I've done tests of toxicity. And the bottom line is the volatile organic compounds come out reliably well. And I don't think it matters uh, what the uh, heating regime is, whether it's sauna, traditional uh, saunas or fire and bread or Epsom salt baths. Uh, uh, Bill Ray in America had a very similar biochemical results. And my experience is that, uh, that 50 episodes will halve the body load. Toxins come out exponentially. So uh, you, you never get to zero, but you know, 50 will halve, 50 will take, another 50 will take it to 25%, another 50 will get it to 12%, and so on. And because we live in such a toxic world, my view is we should all be doing some sort of heating regime at least once a week. My favorite is Epsom salts, uh, which are uh, inexpensive. You can get um, 20 kilograms, for about 40 pounds, and uh, soak in that is a double one because A, you detox with the skin, and B, you get a nice dose of magnesium, which is good for the mitochondria, and also sulfate, which further helps to detoxify. And these are other uh, nutritional interventions, which again, are all going to help to reduce the toxic load. I'm not gonna read those, I'm quite sure you're capable of reading. Okay, so once the mitochondria is sorted, we then tackle the control mechanisms. That's the thyroid accelerator pedal and the adrenal gearbox. And the point here is that both thyroid hormones and adrenal hormones many of their actions, they are manifest via mitochondria. So you have to get the mitochondria in a fit state to respond before you start uh, uh, adjusting, uh, treating with thyroid hormones or an adrenal hormones or, or, or both. So it's so important to do things in the correct order. Otherwise, as I call it, you're, uh, you're flogging a dead horse. So we use thyroid and adrenal glands to closely match energy delivery to energy demands. And that's very important from an evolutionary perspective because we cannot afford to waste a drop of energy. Energy, uh, the, 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 throughout evolution, the main rate limiting step is going to be fuel, you know, food supply, and we cannot afford to waste fuel, fuel uh, food. Food is a very precious resource. And the thyroid and adrenal glands allow us to closely match energy delivery the energy demand. We cannot uh, do, uh, 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 must not be wasteful of that in that respect. The underactive thyroid, generally speaking, is very badly treated. And the problem with uh, uh, conventional diagnosis of th the underactive thyroid is the only thing that the doctors look at are the blood tests. The blood tests alone can be misleading. Yes, blood tests are very helpful. Uh, TSH, 3T4, uh, 3T3 is the bare minimum, 
but we also have to look at the clinical picture. And uh, uh, these are the symptoms which are peculiar to the underactive thyroid. Uh, again, you can read, I'm not going to read those out. But a characteristic one here is we need thyroid hormones for fat burn. And many people struggle with the ketogenic diet because they do it, they get into ketosis, but they still feel hypoglycemic. They still feel shaky, uh, uh, tremulous, uh, anxious, as, as if they've got low blood sugar. Now, of course, the reason for that is the symptoms of low blood sugar are not due to low blood sugar. They are due to the adrenaline response. If you have an underactive thyroid, then you don't have the thyroid hormones with which to fat burn, and the body fat burns with adrenaline instead. And that gives us that very unpleasant symptom of being wired but tired. And we call that ketogenic hypoglycemia. So that's another very useful clue uh, that uh, the thyroid needs attention uh, 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 you know, when, when things aren't going smoothly. There are some more uh, uh, symptoms, uh, sleep disturbance, proximal myopathy, constipation, headaches. Uh, and then we have, once we've got all these things in place, we can then look at the signs, the clinical signs of, of uh, energy delivery methods. So if everything is working perfectly, then you should have a core temperature of about 37 degrees centigrade. If it's much below 36.6, then that tells us we've got poor energy delivery mechanism. Again, low blood pressure. If you haven't got good energy delivery to the heart, it cannot be powerfully at the pump and you end up with low blood pressure. And the extreme version of that is, of course, postural orthostatic tachycardia. And then if the thyroid is going slow, then the pulse is often slow at rest. Uh, and you know, people who come to see me, they are not top athletes. Uh, they don't have big, massively powerful hearts where, so, and so the heart can beat slowly. But if it's going at much less than 70 beats per minute, suspect the underactive thyroid. That's the bare minimum of tests that we need to do to uh, assess the thyroid. The most important reason for doing this is to make sure that, you, that somebody is not thyroid toxic because we do have effective uh, treatments. We do have natural desiccated thyroid, which is extremely uh, effective and helpful, but we don't want to give that to somebody who um, uh, is already thyroid toxic. So the test is essential. A, to make sure there's no thyroid toxicosis, and B, uh, to see if there's biochemical scope for a trial of thyroid hormones. The point here is that all diagnosis is hypothesis, which we then put to the test. So if having done the diet, sort out your mitochondria, you are still fatigued, you still have pathology, then uh, a trial of natural desiccated thyroid is in order. And the key to this is to start with uh, very low doses and build up uh, slowly. So I start with a quarter of a grain and increase in small increments every two weeks or every, maybe, maybe every week for, for, quarter, uh, for quarter grain increments. And keep an eye on the blood pressure, keep an eye on the pulse, Keep an eye on the core temperature because that will give you clues. And also ask, how do you feel? Because if you are underactive with the thyroid and uh, natural desiccated thyroid is affected, then you will start to feel better. And many of the symptoms uh, mentioned before will then melt away. And the final dose that you need of, of, uh, of uh, natural desiccated thyroid is, is weight related. So little people need less than big people. So that's a typical sort of daily dose to, to aim at. Another useful test uh, is the adrenal stress profile. And this is a typical uh, result for somebody who's got ME or chronic fatigue syndrome, showing low levels of cortisol and low levels of DHA. Uh, and in fact, this is a particularly interesting uh, result because if you get a very flat uh, uh, result like that with no dial rhythm, that very much points to the underactive thyroid. Okay. Uh, and again, it's a two-pronged approach. First of all, ask the question why that person has adrenal fatigue. You know, and the commonest cause of that is metabolic syndrome, i.e. the body is being powered by sugars and carbohydrates. That is uh, uh, very stressful for the adrenal glands and, uh, and exhausting. And uh, I start off using uh, adrenal support like pregnenolone, DHA, adrenal glandulars. And again, we adjust that uh, with a core temperature. We fine tune with core temperature. Okay. So to improve mitochondrial function, and mitochondrial function, mitochondria are implicated in almost any disease pathology you care to, to, to mention. Uh, um, uh, Dale Bredson, for example, reverses dementia using uh, a paleoketogenic diet, uh, and all these were well, all the interventions that we described, and he can re reverse dementia completely. 
Similarly, heart failure. Uh, similarly, if you want to treat slow down cancer, uh, prevent cancer, whatever, then you treat your mitochondria. And not only do you have to put in place all these interventions, but you have to do things in the right order. Uh, and that's because you have to start with the PK diet, because if you're eating carbohydrates, you will have a fermenting gut. And if you've got a fermenting gut, then supplements simply feed the gut fermenting. They don't feed you. So you can spend, and, and so often I have patients who come see me and they're taking all the mitochondrial support and they're maybe playing with thyroid hormones and they've done some detox regimes, but they've not done the paleo-ketogenic diet. They haven't got the right fuel in the tank and they will be malabsorbing their supplements. So getting the, the diet right and the gut sorted out is absolutely critical. And we do that with the diet, with vitamin C, with Nugol's iodine. Uh, and then we need a basic package of supplements because diets are deficient. And then we can add in the mitochondrial package of supplements because then you'll absorb them well. And then you can start to bounce up the adrenal gearbox and the thyroid accelerator pedal. And if you suspect toxicity problems, and often there are clues from the history, put in place the relevant detox regimes. If you think there's an immunological hole in the, in the energy bucket, and again, you can get clues from that from the history. And again, army laboratories are incredibly helpful to identify uh, which chronic infection may be there. Then uh, that needs to be treated appropriately. Um, uh, and throughout all this, pace activity, expect to have a bumpy ride, be satisfied with gentle progress. And if you get stuck, then uh, I run workshops, um, which are often very helpful. So, I'm Sarah, really Sarah yes. could I just ask, please, you've got chapter there on the right. Is that referring to your book? It's not hypochondria, it's mitochondria. I'm ashamed, so I can't remember if it's from the if it's if it's the ecological medicine book or if it's from the chronic fatigue syndrome book, which is shameful. But okay. uh, it's um, it, most of these sub well, these subjects are covered in both. So okay. the chronic fatigue syndrome, yes, the the it's mitochondria, it's not hypochondria. We, patients love that 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 title, and so do I. I. Do as well. uh, mm -hmm. uh, then that is um, uh, a very useful uh, starting point to tell you where to go. So I'm very mindful. I've whizzed through those slides deliberately. I'm, I've done an hour and a half lecture in 45 minutes. Forgive me. Please, Gillian, do send the, the slides around to people listening in. But now at least you've got some time for some questions. Oh, thank you very, very much. Absolutely fascinating information, particularly that POTS is um, perhaps primarily mitochondrial driven. Would you say so? Because that's always a big question mark in patients' minds. POTS is not a diagnosis, it's a symptom. And we have to ask the question why. Now, if energy delivery to the heart is impaired, then the heart cannot beat powerfully as a pump. And so the first thing that happens is the blood pressure falls. Now, it's much easier to pump, circulate blood around the body on the flat, on the horizontal. And as soon as you go vertical, you have to increase cardiac output by about 20%. Now, if energy delivery to the heart is so awful, you can't do that. You haven't got the energy to increase cardiac output by 20%. Now, the the heart makes a desperate attempt to do that by beating faster. And it gets faster and faster and faster. But that too is demanding of energy. So by beating faster and faster and faster, it'll maintain blood pressure for a certain length of time, but that's not sustainable. Suddenly the blood pressure drops precipitously and unless that patient lies down pretty quickly, they are going to pass out because of, of severe low blood pressure. So much of POT is poor energy delivery to the heart. And how do we treat that? by improving energy delivery mechanisms to the heart with all the interventions that we talked about this evening. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I'll go, just go through some of the questions now. Um, there are a lot, so we may not manage them all. Um, I have a patient on the carnivore diet. Is this sustainable long-term? Absolutely, yes. Uh, 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 in fact, in the uh, PK1, the how, I, I cite the example of uh, Arctic explorers that went and lived with the Inuit Indians where they ate simply uh, meat, and fish and nothing else for a year, and they remain perfectly healthy. So the carnivore diet is a perfectly healthy diet and is often a very good starting point where people have got uh, gut problem problems or, or allergies or both. So really the paleoketogenic diet is the, is the end point really. That's, that's you know, people assume it's the starting point, but for many it's the end point where we should end up the evolutionary correct diet. And with serious gut problems, uh, then yes, the carnivore diet is a great start. Some people like to fast for a few days. Some used to like to use the mare technique to get their guts uh, settled and improved. But the carnivore diet, perfectly healthy, and I'm very happy for uh, people to eat carnivore. Thank you. Um, can it be done with vegetarians? I think they're not so much the carnivore diet, but the PK diet. And Absolutely. if not, 
uh, what do you say to them? Absolutely. It is perfectly possible to have several vegetarians who are PK uh, 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 and are vegetarian. Obviously, eggs is a great source of uh, 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 protein and fuel. Um, and yes, it is possible. It's not easy. It's tricky because, of course, vegetarian and vegan diets especially tend to be high in carbohydrates. And what I do know is that being vegetarian and vegan is a major risk factor for chronic fatigue syndrome and ME. So I do encourage my patients to consume uh, 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 eggs and, and some meats. And, and believe me, I share the same concerns for animal welfare as, as, as vegetarians and vegans. I'm, of course, very privileged. I have my own pigs, I have my own ducks, I have my own chickens. Blah, 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 blah. So, you know, I only eat good quality meat. But organic meat has very high uh, animal welfare standards, and that would be a very good start. But yes, it is possible. Thank you. And is it okay for those with gallbladder issues, or if they've even had their gallbladder removed, and for those with fat malabsorption? Absolutely. Now, uh, I mean, fat intolerance is a very common problem. And I think that's because you know, the vast majority of the world, you know, fuel their body on sugars and carbohydrates and have bought into this philosophy that high fat diets get high cholesterol, which gives you heart disease. Rubbish, rubbish, rubbish. So people are endlessly told, cut out fat and fat food, cut out fat and fat food. Now, the upshot of that is the body is incredibly efficient. It doesn't waste anything. And if you are not consuming fats, then you won't produce the enzymes to digest it and you won't produce the bile salts to emulsify. So you have to build up the fats very slowly. And in the early stages, you may well benefit from nutritional uh, supplements, pancreatic enzymes, maybe bile salts, to help you to assimilate those fats efficiently. And you won't need those forever. Lovely study published in the Journal of Nutritional Medicine in the mid-1980s by um, uh, uh, John McLaren Howard and uh, Stephen Davis, looked at the ability of people to digest. And it, they were initially they were dealing with people who had allergies and therefore had disturbed gut function. And many of them had poor pancreatic function and uh, poor production of bile salts. So uh, having established that, they then gave them supplements, bought them about 18 months later, retested them, and normal pancreatic function and normal bile flow had been restored. So you have to make the body work. And it all starts with chewing, to stimulate, and start with small amounts of fat and build up slowly, and maybe use smoothies because uh, smoothies effectively emulsify those fats and make them very much uh, uh, more uh, easier to digest and to assimilate. So yeah, fat intolerance is a problem for somebody, but for, for many, but start low, go slow and work at it. Thank you. Um, another question here about um, more thyroid function, iodine. Is there altern an alternative to iodine for someone who is intolerant to it for thyroid reasons? Iodine intolerance is very rare. Uh, the, nearly always iodine allergy results from the use of iodine uh, radioactive nucleotides for medical imaging. So it is unusual to be allergic to iodine. If you're not sure, then uh, just test it, get bits of a, a drop of iodine and put a little drop on your skin uh, like that, and you get a nice yellow spot. And uh, if it, as long as you don't get a rash or uh, uh, an itch with that, then it's unlikely you're going to be allergic to iodine. But iodine, we, you know, I've just finished writing a, a book uh, about the thyroid. And of course, one of the nice things about writing books, it makes you really research uh, what's going on. And so I really researched iodine, and it's clear that iodine sufficiency is pretty much pandemic. We simply don't consume enough of the stuff. Now, iodine is one of my favorite multitasking tools. So all the tools we're talking about, all these naturopathic you know, tools like vitamin C, like peak it up, like iodine, they are all intrinsically safe. The potential for harm is minimal. Uh, and they multitask, they do a great many different jobs. And iodine is not just essential for the thyroid gland, but it's also essential for skeletal muscles, for our immune system, for our brain. Lack of iodine is the, is the single most common cause of mental deficiency in the world today. So um, iodine is an absolutely um, essential and, uh, uh, and, and taking iodine at night, uh, what you want to do is about two or three drops in a, in a small glass of water, swill it around your mouth first, because that will kill any fermenting microbes in the mouth that clear, clears up dental plaque, uh, gum disease, and then swallow it. And again, that helps to kill any microbes in the upper fermenting gut. So you can sleep the night 
with a nice clean upper gut and with a nice clean upper gut it can then heal and repair overnight. Well, thank you. Um, some people are asking whether upper fermenting gut is the same as SIBO? Yes, now I deliberately keep the, 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 the uh, definition wide. Upper fermenting gut doesn't imply an organism. It includes Helicobacter pylori, small bowel bacterial overgrowth, fungal overgrowth, and maybe uh, uh, um, uh, other, in, other uh, worms, parasites, whatever. It's a generic, vague term. But the point is, using vitamin C, which contact kills all microbes, using iodine, which contact kills all microbes, improving digestion, you know, improving stomach acid, that contact kills all microbes. So the treatments are effective regardless of the cause of the upper. And so many people, you know, uh, will do a test, they'll do small bowel bacterial overgrowth, and it will come back normal, and they'll say, oh, there we go, I don't have enough of fermenting gut, it's okay for me to go and eat lots of sugars and carbohydrates and fruit and so on, when it absolutely is. So again, I rarely do those tests, um, uh, because it's not good to change the management, the management is the same. There are little wretches out with the paleo ketogenic diet, and kill with vitamin C, uh, iodine, and by restoring normal digestion. One attendee has then asked, well, if you don't do the test, how do you know if you have an upper fermenting gut other than farts that smell of hydrogen sulfide? Are there other obvious signs? Farts that smell of hydrogen sulfide is abnormal lower fermenting gut. That's the large bowel. Now, if you've got an upper fermenting gut, then you usually get symptoms within you know, a few minutes or up to an hour of eating food. And things like reflux, heartburn, indigestion, bloating, uh, stomach doesn't empty, so you feel full after meals. Uh, maybe at night, cough as, the, as you get uh, uh, um, uh, stomach acid coming up into the uh, back of the throat. The need for proton pump inhibitors, the need for acid blockers and Gaviscon, you know, all those give us clues that there's upper fermenting gut. But there's another very important clue, which is that when you've got an upper fermenting gut, the immune system is very busy in the gut to keep those microbes you know, contained. And lovely work done by Rosemary Waring um, um, uh, shows that, um, uh, not Rosemary, Caroline Pond, lovely work by Caroline Pond, shows that the immune, that the body dumps fat where the immune system is busy. So if you have got you know, a beer belly, if you've got a, a, a waist that's, you know, um, uh, dimensions is, is, is greater than your chest or your hips, then again, that's another big clue that you've got an upper fermenting gut. So it's a clinical diagnosis and you know, people eating high carbohydrate diets if they've been eating them for, for, for decades, which most have, almost invariably, they're going to have an upper fermenting gut. It's a very common problem. Oh, thank you. And then um, you haven't mentioned much about um, casein intolerance. Is it necessary to be dairy free on your diet? Well, um, uh, again, we have to, whenever you get a difficult question like that, always go back to evolutionary principles, you know. And you know, uh, did primitive man uh, consume dairy products through, throughout life? No. Does any other mammal consume dairy products throughout their adult life? And the answer is no. Dairy products evolved for young mammals. And if young mammals do not um, grow very quickly, then they are predated by uh, predators. So all dairy products contain growth promoters. And that's the central part of surviving you know, the early weeks and months of life. And that if you want to avoid getting cancer, then you should not be eating growth hormones. And we know that um, uh, dairy products are a risk factor for breast cancer, for example. And uh, any of you in any doubt, then do read Professor Jane Plant's book, Your Life in Your Hands. And she herself had a breast cancer. She'd had all the surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy that was possible. And she ended up with a, a large lump in her breast. And she read that in China, where they do not consume dairy products, the incidence of breast cancer is very low. So she cut out the dairy products and she watched that tumour melt away and she went on to survive another 17 years, I think. So uh, dairy products are growth promoting. They're also made risk factor for um, heart disease. And you're probably aware of the work of uh, David Fried, our lovely David Fried, um, who uh, did a study looking at dairy consumption throughout Europe uh, and equated that to um, uh, heart disease. And essentially, the more dairy products that are consumed, the greater the incidence of heart disease. And that one of the mechanisms of that is um, uh, uh, that the proportion of calcium to magnesium in dairy products is too high. 10 parts calcium, to one part magnesium. When our physiological requirements are one part calcium to one part magnesium. Now they're absorbed by a similar mechanism. And so if you've got a lot of calcium, 
then you, that will induce a relative magnesium deficiency. And magnesium deficiency is a major risk factor of cardiac dysrhythmias and heart disease. And of course, mitochondrial dysfunction. So dairy products are definitely out. Okay, thank you. Just linking up to what you've just mentioned, but I think you've already answered this. Is it okay to take iodine and magnesium last thing at night? Oh, gosh, yes, absolutely. Totally yeah. desirable. Yeah. Um, infrared sauna. Um, this patient says she's not in a position to actually obtain one, you know, buy one herself, even portable. She's read that infrared blankets are not properly infrared. Um, is this true? And do they work well enough? Or would it be better to go to a center that has infrared saunas a couple of times a week? Um, um, uh, my guess it'd be less expensive to, to get your own uh, infrared blanket, which, which work perfectly well. But say my preferred method is Epsom salts in the bath, because most people have got a bath. If you haven't got a bath, you only got a shower, you can buy from Amazon a sort of barrel um, which sits in your shower. Uh, and it's called, I think it's called a shower bath. Uh, and then you can fill that with Epsom salts. So you have a shower, have a good old soak with Epsom salts, uh, which is very relaxing. So you get a lovely dose of magnesium and sulfate uh, and, um, and it's very inexpensive. So bath costs, it's about 50 pence worth of magnesium sulfate in each bath. So that's very efficient. But uh, I mean, yes, uh, uh, I mean, I tend to recommend that people go to uh, Mark and Robin at Get Fit, who do a range of quality, Father in Fred sauna products. So uh, ask Mark or Robin there, and I'm quite sure that they will be able to advise better than I can. Yeah, and the same patient asks if she does go to an infrared sauna, how often should she to try to remove toxins? Okay. And should she combine that with B12 injections? Well, the first point is that the, the infrared sauna, the getting hot, is only half the treatment because the, the point about getting hot is that then mobilizes volatile organic compounds and pesticides from the subcutaneous fat onto the lipid layer of the surface of the skin, and there you must shower it off. So the washing off is just as important as the sauna. If you don't wash up, those toxins are simply going to be uh, reabsorbed. And that's why the extra salt bars are so good, because obviously they're just, stuff is being washed off as soon as it gets onto the surface of the skin. So, uh, but again, Look at frequency, roughly speaking, 50 saunas or 50 heating regimes, 50 epsom salt will halve the toxic load, will halve the body's load. So the more often you can do it, the better. But some people are so unwell, they simply don't tolerate too much detoxing too soon. And so against the old story, start with low doses, short times, low temperatures, and build up gradually. So you don't produce a, a too rapid a detox and thereby poison yourself. Ah, thank you. Another question here. Um, can infections, particularly viral infections, directly drive mitochondrial dysfunction? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Again, that's one of the, the fascinating uh, bits of work that come from uh, John McLaren Howard. He demonstrates that many patients uh, looking at transicator protein, you see viral proteins actually stuck on transicator protein and therefore inhibiting mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, inhibiting mitochondria directly. So absolutely, yes. Thank you. Um, going back to Lugol's for a moment, why does it need to be taken away from vitamin C and does it need to be on an empty stomach? Uh, it needs to be taken away from vitamin C because they work in different ways. Vitamin C is an oxidizing agent and uh, our iodine is a reducing agent. So one is an electron donor and the other is electron receiver. So uh, if you drop iodine into vitamin C, the color disappears instantly as you, as you, uh, as you knock out the iodine. So that's the, that's the reason for taking them separately. And it doesn't have to be on empty stomach, but, but by the time you go to bed, you should have an empty stomach uh, because you will sleep much better for that. Uh, again, I know I haven't gone into sleep in any detail, but uh, again, many people recognize that with age, they don't sleep so well if they have a big meal lasting at night. So aim to consume your food within a 10 hour window of time. So you've got 14 hours of the day when the stomach is empty, during which time it can really heal and repair and, 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 uh, and normalize function. Thank you. Um, you mentioned MetaVive in the heading of one of your slides, but didn't really talk about it. Um, how does it compare with Armour, Nature, Thyroid, and those other um, NTDs that you discussed? Essentially, these are all the same products. These are all uh, dried pig thyroid gland. Now, there are minor differences between them, but uh, essentially they are the same thing. 
Now, the first case of the anorak thyroid was treated in the 1890s. And that was a, a woman uh, who was treated with uh, pig, dried pig thyroid gland and she made a, a miraculous uh, recovery. And, um, uh, and that natural desiccated thyroid, so it's just simply pig thyroid that's been dried, standardized, is, continues to be the best treatment today. And Metaveve is another form of natural dried desiccated thyroid. And uh, Metaveve 1, which is the, the smallest capsule, is equivalent to a quarter of a grain of natural desiccated thyroid. Metaveve 2 is equivalent to half a grain of natural desiccated thyroid. So I think I gave a slide earlier as the sort of doses that most people end up taking, but somebody like myself, who's about nine, nine and a half stone, uh, would take Metaveve 2, maybe three or maybe four a day in order to normalize their thyroid function. Thank you. Um, one question here, I can imagine what your answer will be. It's how long should you do the PK diet before moving on to the next stage? Oh, quite quickly. And also there's a certain momentum about getting well. You want to keep that up because uh, the number of microbes in, your, in the gut uh, is very much determined by what substrate you have to ferment. So, um, you know, looked at the other way around, given the right substrate, microbes will double their numbers every 20 minutes. So if you're eating the wrong foods, the numbers will, will increase very rapidly. As soon as you, but by contrast, as soon as you starve them, as soon as you stop feeding, then the numbers will come down very rapidly. And that will be further assisted by the vitamin C and the iodine, and chewing food and all that. So, um, you know, a few days, it's not, okay. it's, not, it's not a case, oh, you've got to be, well, get PK adapted, get into ketosis, and then you can start the supplements and you will absorb them, and then you can move on with the rest of the program. So, you know, quite quickly. Oh, that's great. And is a PK diet recommended for patients with myasthenia gravis um, and muscle weakness? Oh, gosh, yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I can't think of a condition where the PK diet is not indicated. Uh, I, I mean, one of the most important points about ketones is that they are markedly anti-inflammatory. And um, uh, sugar, by contrast, and, and, and fast carbohydrates are markedly pro-inflammatory. And Marcina gravis is an autoimmune condition. It's an, it's an inflammatory condition where we're making antibodies against self, and that is obviously an immune error. And anything we can do to damp down that inflammation is going to be helpful. I would hate to say that uh, a PK diet will cure myasthenia gravis. I wouldn't dare say that. But having one uh, autoimmune disorder greatly increases your risk of others. Now, the commonest autoimmune disorder is probably the underactive thyroid. And thankfully, we can treat that efficiently with natural desiccated thyroid and metaveve or whatever. But uh, there are other autoimmune conditions, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, myasthenia gravis, uh, 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 primary biliary cirrhosis, which we can do without. And the instance of autoimmunity is just skyrocketing at the moment. And um, the more we can do to keep the body in an anti-inflammatory state, then the better than, uh, th that we are, the healthier we can be. And ketones are absolutely central to that. Thank you. Any thoughts on the use of exogenous ketones? Well, you can use them, but they're jolly expensive. Yeah. You know, they're, they're sort of uh, uh, 60 quid a, a bottle um, uh, and, 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 and then there's biologically, physiologically, there's nothing to be gained uh, by that. Um, it, okay, it might give you a, a, a quicker reading on your ketone breath meter, but you know, as soon as you have done the diet correctly, you will be blowing ketones most of the time. Now, I don't think you have to be in ketosis all the time, every second of the day, but at least once a day, uh, I want people to be blowing ketones. Thank you. Maybe just a couple more questions, if that's all right. I know we've sure. just already passed seven. Um, does iodine have any negative impact on beneficial or commensal gut flora? No, because, again, one of the joys of using iodine and vitamin C is you can swallow it down so you get you know, a good concentration in the mouth, the esophagus, the gut, and then the stomach. It does what it has to be done then, and then it is absorbed into the bloodstream, and both are excreted in urine. So now you're not upsetting the friendly microbe in the large bowel or the friendly anaerobes there. So, yeah, so the only time that vitamin C will impact on that is if you overdose, if you take too much. If you have a big dose of, of vitamin C, and of course everybody's bowel tolerance is a little bit different, but you know, if I, for example, if I took say 20 grams of vitamin C, then not all of that would be absorbed. Most of it would remain in the gut. It would get down into the large bowel, 
And because vitamin C can cause a slight osmotic diarrhea, it will get down to the large bowel and start killing the friendly microbes in the large bowel, which then get fermented by other friendly microbes. And that's when you get bowel swelling wind and a rumbly tummy. So that's a good clinical clue that you're at bowel tolerance of vitamin C and you need to reduce the dose. But when you get the dose of vitamin C right, you should have no abnormal gut symptoms whatsoever. Okay, two, I think, short questions to finish with. Should one leave out the iodine if one has hypothyroidism? In other not words, at all, uh, no. or Graves' uh, disease? Not at all. No, yes, you know, we need thyroid, uh, iodine for the thyroid, but it's, it's equally essential for quality breast tissue, for the immune system, for, for striated muscle, for the heart, for the brain function. Uh, for detoxing, I mean, it's, I say, one of my favorite multitasking tools. It's not just about the thyroid. So it's a gloriously safe, very inexpensive uh, multitasking tool that arguably we should all be taking. Oh, thank you. And, and this could help a few attendees, I think. Um, the question is, can you please recap, if you've not sorted thyroid and adrenal insufficiency, should you not start the PK diet? How should you begin? No, always start with the PK diet. Uh, 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 because uh, uh, until you get you, you address your upper fermenting gut, you're just going to malabsorb. And if you're malabsorbing, you then don't have you cannot access the raw materials to start to correct mitochondria. So um, uh, that uh, order that I gave right at the end is uh, is, is is very important. I think you've just um, revised your book on the PK diet, haven't you? Have you got it there that you can show it to us? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this one. Yeah, the Fantastic. recipes are, are pretty similar. Uh, there are a few uh, new ones that have gone in there, but there's much more detail um, about uh, you know, uh, how many calories, protein leverage, um, uh, um, how to get into ketosis, how to test, uh, how much fiber to take, uh, de -da -de -da, the importance of chewing, de -da -de -da -de -da. so a lot more of the nitty gritty detail to, so you really get it right first time around. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Well, that was just absolutely tremendous. So many um, big, big thank yous. Uh, lots and lots of gratitude in the chat. We'll actually um, save the chat and the questions and answers. And I hope we can, well, not the answers, the questions that haven't <laughs> been answered. And I hope we'll have you back again very soon to yep. maybe just do a question and answer session because there are so many that we haven't managed to get on to. Yep, that'd be absolutely fine. I'd love to do that, Gillian. Thank you very, very much. And just to mention that we will be offering a discount on our MHI, that's the um, sort of large mitochondrial pro um, profile in our um, new mitochondrial tests as of this coming Tuesday. And so when we send out the, yes, yeah, so when we send out the recording, you will get the recording as well as the slides of Dr. Myhills, then we'll let you know about that as well. It's called um, the MHI, the Mitochondrial Health Index. So thank you very, very much again, Sarah. Absolutely fantastic. I think everybody will be listening to this again because there was so much information in it. Good, fantastic. Look forward to that Good very much, Gillian. You always ask the right questions, so it's very easy. <laughs> David, <everybody. laughs> oh, thank you. Well, it's our attendees. And thank you, everybody who's attended. Absolutely. Wonderful to have had you here. Thank you. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.